Interestingly, if you don't have a uh, modern translation of the Bible, uh, then just take one of these. You're welcome to have one. Uh, Just don't tell anyone I said that. Acts chapter 15, verse 22 is where we begin. Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, men who were leaders among the believers. With them, they sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friends, Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to to not burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. So the men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. After spending some time there, they were sent off by the believers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many of us taught and preached the word of God. May God bless not only the reading of his word, but also the preaching as Jonathan uh, comes to share God's word with us. morning. Would you like to be strengthened, have strength? Would you like to be encouraged? I'm sure this morning, in many different ways, we all need some strengthening in some form. We all need encouragement. But what do we need to be strengthened, to be encouraged as individual believers and as a church together? Well, turn in your Bibles back to Acts 15 if you haven't, if you've closed your Bible, reopen it and and look up the passage that uh, Johnny just read to us. Because what we're going to learn this morning is that as Christians, as believers, as a church, something that we need for strength and encouragement is togetherness in the gospel. Because togetherness in the gospel strengthens the church. The book of Acts is the story of the early church from about 30 AD, from when Jesus went into heaven, the day of Pentecost, through to about 62 AD, when Paul arrived in Rome in chains. And it's an exciting, dramatic story, and mainly it's a story of the growth of the church and of how it increased and spread. But there's a repeated pattern in the book of Acts of a crisis coming, of the crisis being resolved, and the resolution of that crisis leading to the further growth of the church. So, for example, go back to chapter 4, you'll see how Peter and John were told by the Jewish leaders, don't talk about Jesus anymore, stop preaching, or we'll imprison you, or worse. And the believers meet together and pray, Peter and John come back, they carry on preaching about Jesus, And the church grows. Or in chapter 8, the first Christian martyr, Stephen, is being stoned to death by the Jewish leaders. And the church in Jerusalem is scattered to the four winds under persecution. A disaster, you would think. But as they go, the believers share the gospel, new churches are formed, and the word grows. And that happens again and again. And in chapter 15, a new crisis arises. And it's a critical point in the life of this young movement. And what's at stake is huge. 
Here's the question. Will Gentile converts have to follow the Jewish law or not? Would you have to convert to Judaism as well as believing in Jesus to be saved? As a crisis, it could lead this fledgling Christian movement, couldn't it, to divide into two parts. There might be a a Jewish church and a Gentile church. Or maybe there'd be no more work amongst the Gentiles. See, the church in Jerusalem was Jewish believers, and they largely still followed the Jewish law. But now there is a church in Antioch, and there are churches in modern-day Turkey that Paul has founded, which are Gentile churches. The believers are not Jews. They don't follow the Jewish law. But there's some Kino Jewish believers in Jerusalem who don't like this. They've gone to Antioch, and they've started to tell the Gentile Christians... Hey, it's great you believe in Jesus, but you have to be circumcised. You have to follow the Jewish law if you're going to be saved. And last week, as we saw, as Johnny took us through the first half of the chapter, the church in Antioch, in response to this, they sent Paul and Barnabas down up to Jerusalem to meet with the church leaders there to talk about this issue. The apostles and elders met together and they concluded, no, no. Gentile believers don't have to follow the Jewish law. They don't need to be circumcised to be saved. So James suggests that they write a letter. And this morning we're going to see what happens next, how the crisis is averted. And throughout the account, throughout this second half of the chapter, we see togetherness in the gospel. The passage is full of it. We see at the beginning how the Jerusalem church, the apostles, the elders, and the members of the church are united together in their decision to send the letter and to send two men with the letter to Antioch. The word translated believers in this part of the in, in, in this chapter is actually the word brothers and sisters. That's, that's the actual underlying word. The church in Jerusalem, the church in Antioch, they are brothers and sisters. They are one family. And the letter itself is a model of of friendship. You see the warmth in the way that it's written and in what they write. Just look at how it's addressed in verse 23. The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile brothers and sisters in Antioch, Syria and Cilicia. The letter speaks warmly of Paul and Barnabas, the leaders of the church in Antioch, our dear friends. But this togetherness is not a superficial togetherness. It's not just skin deep. It has a foundation. It has roots. It has a reason. There's a reason why there is this unity. And that reason is the gospel. It's the good news of free salvation available to everyone through faith in Jesus Christ without the need to obey the Jewish law. Their unity together, their their bonds together are in the gospel. And that is our fellowship together as a church, isn't it? And with other churches, it is a togetherness in the gospel because we all believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Any other partnership we might have is only superficial or temporary. It's only the gospel that can truly bring people together who hold nothing else in common. Togetherness in the gospel strengthens the church. I just want to pick out four lessons from this passage for us this morning. The first of those is this. Let us decide together in submission. Let us decide together in submission. The discussion that's taken place in the first half of the chapter was among the apostles and the elders. You see that in verse 6. So there's a little phrase in verse 22 that is very striking. We read there, then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided. It's the whole church that agrees with what the apostles and elders are saying. You see, it's vitally important that the Gentile churches know they don't need to obey the Jewish law. So that their churches can flourish and grow, so the gospel can continue to spread among the Gentiles. And that's why, along with the letter... They all together decide to send two men who could confirm the decision. They send Judas and Silas 
along with the letter. They make the decision together as a whole church for the gospel, for the sake of the gospel. But the ruling that the apostles and elders in Jerusalem had come to must have caused much soul-searching amongst the believers in Jerusalem, in, in the church there, because they were Jewish. Because it's true, isn't it, for more than a thousand years to be one of God's people, if you were a male, you had to be circumcised. Since the time of Moses, whether you were male or female, to be one of God's people, you had to keep the Jewish law. That's what you call a long-standing tradition, a long-standing custom, more than a thousand years. And now the apostles and elders are saying to be one of God's people, you don't need to be circumcised, you don't need to keep the Jewish law. And it must be that many of the Jewish believers in that church agreed with the apostles and elders, despite that long-held tradition, despite holding on to those customs and thinking it's hard to give it up. It must have been hard for them to make that decision, to agree with the church. But they gladly submit to the leadership of the church and their decision for the sake of the gospel. As a church together, we believe it's biblical, it's healthy, it's good that we make decisions together as a whole church, that the members of the church are responsible for major decisions that we make. So as we make decisions, we need to follow the example of this Jewish church, make the decisions in unity together for the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus that should be the prime, the preeminent reason why we make decisions. As a church membership, we appoint elders, don't we, to lead and direct the church under God for the advancement of the gospel. Now, I know that each of us holds many things dear to us personally, individually. We each have pre preferences and traditions we hold to with regard to, say, church practice that individually we each value. That might be something relatively trivial, like the style of worship. It might be when and how often we should meet. It might be what we call ourselves as a church. Or one of many other things. There are things we will hold personally dear to us. And it's difficult to give up on customs and traditions and preferences. Especially if we've held them for some time. But the Jerusalem church, under the leadership and direction of the apostles and elders, they agree to give up tradition and a custom they've held for over a thousand years. How much harder it must have been for them to do that than it would be for us to give up on some of our personal preferences. So following their example, we should be more willing to submit to the leadership of our church in decision-making, even, perhaps especially, when those proposals may go against our own personal preferences or opinions or traditions. Because when our elders make proposals or suggest changes, I'm sure they do not do so lightly or frivolously. I'm sure that much thought and prayer goes into them as they seek God's guidance. And our own personal preference or, pre or, or, or custom should always take second place to what will further the gospel. We should decide things together for the sake of the gospel. And if we're not sure whether a particular proposal will further the gospel or not, Perhaps we should trust the elders, since we've appointed them to lead us as they are led by God. Because as we see in this chapter, when we make decisions together in unity for the sake of the gospel, it will strengthen us as a church. So let's decide together in submission to the word of God, of course, that is preeminent, but also to our elders and leaders. This leads on to our second lesson, which is this. Let us give together in generosity. Let us give together in generosity. You see, the Jerusalem church is eager to encourage the church in Antioch 
eager to welcome Gentile believers as brothers and sisters. And so they decide to send two of their own men, their own leaders, to go with this letter. Look at verse 22. They chose Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, men who were leaders among the brothers and sisters. And their task, we see in verse 27, is to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. You see, the troublemakers who were teaching in Antioch had come from Jerusalem, so it seems good to the church in Jerusalem to send two of their own men, two of their own leaders, who were authorised by the church in Jerusalem to contradict those unauthorised teachers. Judas and Silas will be able to confirm by word of mouth what the letter says, what it means, explain the ruling and the decision in more detail with the authority of the Jerusalem church, which will make the message more certain to the Gentile believers. And the result of the Jerusalem church sending these two men with the letter helps to further the unity of the churches. Look down at verse 32. We read there, Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the brothers and sisters. Now for the Jerusalem church to send these two men was a generous and sacrificial act. They were brothers of the church. They were like family, so they'd be missed like family. It's hard to send one of your family members off to something, isn't it? They'd be missed. And they were leaders in the church, so they would leave gaps in ministry that would need to be fulfilled by other people. But for the sake of gospel togetherness, (coughs) for the kingdom of God, for the sake of the Gentile believers, and for others who would come to faith, the church willingly makes that sacrifice. You see, if the issue of circumcision isn't resolved, the growth of Christianity among the Gentiles is going to be at threat. They're sending these men to confirm that keeping the Jewish law isn't necessary for Gentiles. And in so doing, they're making a gift for mission. They're giving their men away for a period so that the mission among the Gentiles can go forth. A gift that will enable the gospel to continue to grow among the nations. And we too can express our togetherness in the gospel by being generous in giving. Now, that might mean giving money to support gospel work here in Torvine or in Newport, in our region, in our nation, or across the world. It might mean being willing to give our people, perhaps to release members and leaders of our church to help other churches, perhaps even to go on mission trips or mission visits. And it means supporting missionaries that we as a church will send out in God's grace. So just one example of that is our affiliation with the Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches means that we are supporting gospel work across the United Kingdom in various churches, in I think 700 churches. And as a church we do so willingly and eagerly in partnership with them for the gospel. And it's a sacrifice in the sense that we make from our budget to do that. So let us give together in generosity for the sake of the gospel. And as we do that, the church is strengthened and encouraged. Hopefully we're strengthened and encouraged as we hear the effect that our giving is having, but the churches that we help are strengthened and encouraged. That might be because the union at Bible College can train more men and women for the ministry, which will serve other churches, and they serve churches in various other ways as well. Or the FIEC can support churches doing mission across the UK. Or our very own Catherine, because she can facilitate short-term mission work in Asia. That leads to people being saved. And perhaps short-term missionaries going on into long-term areas of service across the world. See, in all these ways and countless others, generous giving by United Church will serve to strengthen the church worldwide. And that brings us to our third lesson. Let us rejoice together in the gospel. Let us rejoice together 
in the gospel. The delegation comes to Antioch, and the first thing they do is they gather the church together. Look at verse 30. The men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. The people, that is the church, they read the letter. And what's the response? How does the gathered church react? They were glad for its encouraging message. They rejoice. The message is encouraging. But why? What about this letter encourages them? (coughs) I think there are mainly two things. The first thing, they're going to be glad. They're going to rejoice because of the togetherness, the partnership in the gospel that the apostles and the elders and the whole Jerusalem church is showing them. They're glad, they rejoice because they're being called brothers and sisters. But also they rejoice because the letter confirms to them the gospel, the message that Paul had preached to them and which they believed. The letter confirms, you see, that circumcision isn't needed. The law isn't, doesn't need to be followed. The gospel is the good news that it is by God's grace alone, his overflowing love and goodness, through faith alone, trusting in Jesus Christ, in Christ alone, that people are saved. Believers in Jesus don't need to do anything to add to what Jesus has done. Jesus has done it all. They don't need to be circumcised. They don't need to keep the Jewish law. They need to follow rituals and ceremonies. Of course they rejoice. Of course they are glad. You see, the Gentiles as a whole, they know that Jews regard them as outsiders. Because Gentiles don't know the God of the Bible. Gentiles are excluded from being part of the people of God. Gentiles are not able to participate in the wonderful promises that God makes to his people in the Old Testament. But now, as this letter confirms, in Christ, all of that has changed. It's all changed. As Paul later writes to the church in Ephesus, Ephesians 2, verse 11, he says to them, to a church of Gentiles, remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth, you were separate from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship in Israel. (coughs) Foreigners to the covenants of the promise. You were without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. So these Gentile Christians now rejoice because these Jewish Christians are telling them Actually, you're not outsiders. You're part of us. You're with us. Of course, you know the God of the Bible because you know our God. You're no longer excluded from being part of the people of God because you're you're with us in Christ. And the promises of God to our people are your promises. They're all together, male and female, Jew and Gentile. Yes, even Welsh and English. One in Christ Jesus. So don't we too rejoice together in the gospel. Because of what Jesus has done, it means that our sins are forgiven, we have eternal life, and our hope is in the life to come. And we rejoice in all that he's done, not just me or you as individuals. Surely we rejoice that he's done it for all of us who confess his name. We rejoice together in our togetherness that he has brought us together as a church and as one church among many churches to be the universal worldwide church of God, to be his people. Let us rejoice together in the gospel. As we do that, the church is strengthened and encouraged. Fourth and finally, let us grow together in ministry. Let us grow together in ministry. See, once the crisis is resolved, Paul and Barnabas continue their previous task 
as leaders of the church in Antioch, preaching and teaching the word of God. Verse 35. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. But do you see they do this with many others? Many others. It's not just a few people, but many people who are involved in teaching and preaching ministry in that church. You see, togetherness in the gospel results in ministry multiplication. Many others are gripped by this gospel message and have a desire to teach others. A church that's encouraged, a strengthened church, a rejoicing church united in the gospel is a church where ministry grows. Church leaders will be encouraged when the church is united together in the gospel. When that is true, their ministry will flourish. The best thing we can do for for Johnny and, and, and John and Mark, is to be united together in the gospel. And that brilliant message of the gospel and unity around that gospel, that will encourage others to want to get involved. If you want to encourage our leaders, the elders, the deacons, ministry leaders, if you want to encourage the church, first of all, be united together in the gospel and then get involved in ministry. Show interest in what's going on. Ask how you can pray and then pray for the ministries that we do. And ask how you can help or serve in those ministries. Let us grow together in ministry. As we do that, the church is further strengthened and encouraged. Once more in the early church, a crisis has been resolved. And togetherness in the gospel strengthens the church. The word grows, the ministry grows, the church grows. They're strengthened because they decide together, because they give together, because they rejoice together, and because they grow in ministry together. For us to be strengthened and encouraged, both as individual believers and as a church, we need to be united together in the gospel. To have that joy of deciding together in submission. Of giving together in generosity. Rejoicing together in the gospel. And growing together in ministry.